Good morning, everyone. I'm looking back at all you've done for me. It seems to me I never take the time. All my hours of heartbreak and despair. Show me how much you really care When I seem lost, oh, you were there There's nothing like the love you give to me It lifts me up and takes me past the stars So far beyond I'd ever thought I'd the wind will blow my lord my god i worship you for who you are and what you do my lord my god i worship you for who you are and what you do you're everything i want to be there's so much more that I can see, yeah. just a name It seems to me there's little that I know You'll never change your way in all the years and your hand it wipes away my tears This hope where once there were fears My Lord, my God And what you do My Lord, my God, I worship you For who you are and what you do You're everything I want to be There's so much more that I can Good morning again, and uh, could you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1? I'll be right back. Let me hang up the guitar. I'll be right back with you. All right, uh, morning again. And uh, if you haven't turned there already, go to do so now. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to wrap up our study of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3 today uh, by noting that uh, Paul wrote briefly in this passage that Paul wrote briefly about this mystery uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So in other words, 
what we're reading about in verses uh, 2 through 13 of Ephesians chapter 3 is developing those two passages and talking about this mystery. And the content of this mystery, as we've been pointing out, is found in verse 6, which teaches us that us Gentile church-age believers are now co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, co-partakers of the Messianic promise uh, with Jewish church-age believers because of our faith in Jesus at justification and our union and identification with Him through the baptism of the Spirit. So uh, today, this will constitute our 139th hour in Ephesians. And uh, again, happy Resurrection Day. That's tomorrow. And uh, and so um, tomorrow I'll be at, uh, teaching at Doctrinal Bible Church. And a lot of times I do uh, specials on the, the resurrection like I did last year, the first time I was really at, uh, there for uh, Easter. And uh, But this time I'm going to do, um, I'm just going to teach First Thess. I'm, on, I'm teaching on First Thessalonians. I just started it last week. Uh, several weeks ago, and uh, tomorrow I'll be working on First Thessalonians uh, verses three and four. Tomorrow in our classes, we have two sessions, starting at nine thirty with a break in between the two. And so, if you're in uh, in the area, come on by. We're going to be observing the Lord's Supper at that, that time. And uh, for Winston Bible Ministry, and by the way, the, the class schedule for Doctrine Bible Church is actually on our Winston.org site, and uh, so you can listen our cla- listen to the classes through our website. Over there, we're going to eventually have video. We already got that working on that, so uh, it looks pretty good. And uh, so we have the PowerPoint slides and the picture of me. It's the kind of like you got here, but uh, but I'll be more I'll be far further away. But it's uh, so we're working on that. So keep that in prayer. And uh, we teach on uh, Sunday mornings over there. And we're located at twelve fifteen Russell Street Northeast in Huntsville, Alabama. That's where I'm, I'm a half mile down the road. That's where I'm broadcasting from. I've been here since uh, two thousand July second of 2020, 2022. Time flies when you're having fun. And uh, we teach there, as I said, on Sundays, starting at 9.30. And we have uh, two sessions with a break in between. They usually go about an hour each. And um, and also we have, uh, usually it's the first Sunday of each month that we observe the Lord's Supper over there. But because the Easter is following on the end of the year, the month, uh, the end of the month, we decided to put the Lord's Supper then. And uh, for Western Bible Ministries, uh, we do it on the first Saturday of each month. And uh, our class schedule, uh, we have also at Doctrine Bible Church, we teach on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. I'm doing the Day of the Lord series over there on Wednesdays. And I try to do the different doctrines of the Christian faith over there on Wednesday evenings. And on Sundays, we have been doing, we just started a new book, First Thessalonians. And uh, Wednesday Bible Ministries, we teach Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday Thursday, and Saturdays at uh, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And... Uh, and so uh, if you uh, all of our classes are recorded video and audio and they're put on put on our wednesday.org page uh, we also have another website logos uh, sermon say, uh, this, uh, the site where we have a lot, a lot of our videos and audios uh, there and uh, we have podcasts at wednesday uh, on itunes spotify amazon music just search for us in, under wednesday bible ministries you can google for us and you'll find these things or you can go to the uh, uh, the wednesday.org page you'll see different things about these the podcast and all that, and the in the classes at Doctrinal Bible Church. Uh, also, I write a lot. I, I'm a, uh, I write a lot. I have over seventeen hundred written articles. Uh, uh, last time I checked, uh, and uh, the different different theological subjects. So I book I break them out on our website uh, into different cari- ca- categories of systematic theology. I also do the exeg- exegesis and exposition of all our books we've ever done for the last thirty years or so are there in exhaustive detail on our website in PDF format. We also have different studies uh, for on different people in the Bible, Greek word studies even, I did years ago. And then I did, uh, I have um, prep school material. Also, I write my own Christian music, as if you heard the song. And uh, if you like what you hear, you can go download those classes from our website. Just on the Wednesday.org page, you see the music tab. Click on that. We also have a, a YouTube page, and I've been on this YouTube since 2011. We've been using our, their streaming video uh, which is very good. Um, we've been using that since I moved to, when I was in Massachusetts. Started that in 2019, uh, August. And also with the with the uh, the the, um, the YouTube page, uh, you can actually access it through the Winston.org page. If you go to the very bottom, you'll see a little insignia for uh, um, YouTube. Just click on that. And there's also Facebook. We have a Facebook page under Winston Bible Ministries, and uh, so. As far as the YouTube page, I, I have recorded video on, uh, and uh, of me performing the various collection of songs I, I've written over the years. I have 
uh, six collection of songs that I've written as a as far as Christian music. Um, I've been writing music since I was 16, so I have a lot of stuff that was secular, you would call it. And then I'm actually working on the seventh collection of songs uh, that um, I, mean, I have three done so far. I'm work. I have uh, uh, another one. I'm, I just need to finish off. I have the music for. It. I just haven't put the uh, the lyrics and the melody yet for it. So I'm working on that. Uh, one of these days, I'll finish that song off as when I get the time. So uh, yeah. So that's uh, if you and if you're uh, if you feel led by the Holy Spirit to give, you can give through the Wednesday.org page. You click the donate tab. You can use PayPal or you can send. Some people send a check. And uh, if you if you're thinking of doing that, it's uh, make it out to Winston Bible Ministries. It's tax deductible. We're a nonprofit church, and uh, you can send it to 603 O'Shaughnessy Ave, Northeast Huntsville, Alabama 35801. And that's for those of you who got the video, you can see the address there. So that's 603 O'Shaughnessy Avenue, Northeast Huntsville, Alabama 35801. Or just if you didn't catch the ad, if you're on the podcast and you, you can't write fast enough, just go to the Winston.org page, and you'll see it address there because we have it there on that site so uh that's uh that's it for the announcements and uh, let's take a moment of silent prayers as our custom we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves and determine if we're in fellowship with god because any mental verbal or overdirect of sin that we know we commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the father son and the holy spirit but according to first john 1 9 if we confess our sins to the father he god the father is faithful and just to forgive us our sins in other words he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, seven says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for this study in Ephesians, and we pray that you would bless us in the study of Ephesians today. I thank you for those who might be joining us live through the, uh, the uh, YouTube uh, streaming video. Thank you for the service that they provide. And uh, I also uh, thank you uh, for those who might be watching and listening to these classes at a later date through the podcast or the, the website and uh, the, or the various media platforms that you've given to us, like YouTube. So... Uh, I also uh, pray, Father, today that everyone in the audience that is a child of God through faith in your Son, help them to learn, to concentrate, to carefully consider the passages and principles we'll be noting here today, and, or the, and to make personal application. And, and pray, for that, Father, as a result, they receive the necessary spiritual nourishment that will help them in their walk with you. I also pray you would empower me to the power of the Spirit to communicate your word with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so this could take place. I pray there be no problems with the recordings, the video, and the audio, and upload these things to our various websites, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray there be no problems with the um, the YouTube uh, streaming service that they provide. And I just pray, Father, that as a result, all of us would be able to uh, enjoy what the Word of God and uh, and uh, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. So it is in His name we pray. Amen. All right, if you haven't turned there already, go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. And uh, we'll be reading that entire chapter momentarily. And uh, uh, today we're going to wrap up our study of Ephesians 3.3. 3. And uh, today we'll be noting that Paul wrote briefly about this mystery that I talked to you uh, in previous classes about in brief. And also just before the opening prayer. In this passage, Paul says he wrote briefly about this mystery. And he did so in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3-14 through 14, as we'll see. And Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11-22. through 22. So... In other words, the autobiographical digression that we're presently looking at in Ephesians chapter 3 verses uh, 2 through 13 is going to develop this even further. And, uh, and we see that uh, this uh, particular chapter is uh, broken out into two sections. Uh, it starts off in verse 1 as if he's going to give, uh, uh, he's gonna give, them give them another prayer. And he doesn't do that though until verses 14 through the end of the chapter. Uh, so there's a break. He starts off and then he breaks it off and doesn't resume the prayer until verse 14. 
And that's because he wants to present to them an autobiographical digression in particular. He wants to give them uh, comfort and, uh, and he does so with a first class conditional statement, which is a tool of persuasion for, for those who, uh, for, for, for a Greek speaking person like Paul, uh, who is immersed in Greek rhetoric, was raised in that. And uh, he knew the Greeks, you know, the Greeks were debaters and they had certain techniques and he uh, employed it in his writing to teach truth. And uh, we saw that a first class condition um, indicates the assumption of truth for the sake of arguments, a tool of persuasion. So it has two parts. A, an if clause, we call it, that's also called by many as a protasis, and then, or the, in other words, it's a premise, and then we have the second part is the then clause, and that's called also an apotasis, and also you can call it the inference from the premise, the protasis, the if clause. And he's trying to persuade them not to get discouraged by his Roman imprisonment. Remember, Paul, when he was writing this, uh, was awaiting his appeal before Caesar. He wrote this between 60 and 62 AD. This is one of his four prison epistles, the others being Philemon, Colossians, which we studied in the past at Winston Bible Ministries when I was in Iowa, and also Philippians, which I did that in, in Iowa as well, in the first church plant. And we see that uh, um, the recipients of this letter, of course, were Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia. It's a circular letter, not just written to the Ephesian Christian community. And so uh, he's trying to, by, by uh, in verses uh, 2 through 12, we have actually the, the protasis, and then verse 13 has the apotasis. And what he's doing in the protasis is he's talking about his stewardship that, was, uh, that God gave him, which is basically speaking about his apostleship and his function as an apostle to communicate the mystery doctrines of the church age uh, and to uh, the Gentile Christian community. And so he's trying to, in this protasis, He's trying to um, tell them that, hey, I, you know, I'm uh, because of what God gave me, uh, I'm being persecuted by Satan and his kingdom. Because he, and if you, as we've been studying in, in the previous classes, and we, we especially in two, cha uh, chapter two, verses eleven through twenty-two, where Jewish and Gentile church age believers are part, composed a new humanity that's going to re restore, along with Jesus Christ, the human race as as the rulers of planet Earth and dispossess Satan and the fallen angels during the millennial reign of Christ. So this is why Paul was being persecuted by unregenerate people who were deceived by the devil. That's why he was unjustly inc incarcerated. And why he was, when he was still writing this, he was still incarcerated, awaiting his appeal before Caesar in his own rented quarters, of course. Acts 28 tells us that, and he could receive people and teach them about the kingdom of God, which he did. So, uh, so he doesn't want them to be discouraged about this Roman imprisonment. There's a purpose behind it. There's a reason why I'm in prison. There's a reason why I'm suffering this kind of persecution and injust injustice. And so don't be worried about it. Don't be concerned. And then in verses 14 to the end of the chapter, he gets back to the prayer, which turns out to be the second of two intercessory prayers in this letter, which actually the second one serves, like the first, as a hinge. And the second one serves, serves as a hinge to the final three chapters of the book. So uh, with that uh, brief review out of the way, let's go and read from the Net Bible, Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, then we'll go back to read my translation in the first 13 verses, and then look finish off verse 3 uh, today. So it says in Ephesians 3, 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, that by revelation the divine secret was made known to me as I wrote before briefly. When reading this, you'll be able to understand my insight into this secret of Christ. Now this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations as it has now been revealed, to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, namely, that through the gospel, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the exercise of his power. To me, less than least of all the saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, a secret that has been hidden for ages in God, who has created all things. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God because of Christ's faithfulness. For this reason, I ask you not to lose heart because of what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, 
And I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you've been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to uh, understand, uh, comprehend all, with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So uh, let's look at my translation of verses 1 through 13. And uh, again, remember, verses 1 through 13 is actually an autobiographical digression, which is seeking to persuade, again, the recipients of this letter, who are Gentile Christians living in the various cities and uh, uh, towns in the Roman province of Asia in the first century AD, uh, between 60 and 62 AD to be specific, he's trying to persuade them not to be discouraged about this Roman imprisonment. So, and, and, and when he does that, he's actually telling them along the way about this mystery, the content of this mystery, and, uh, and uh, as we just read briefly and we'll continue to look at. So it says in verse uh, 1, it says, For this reason, I myself, Paul, the prisoner owned by and under the authority of the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, for the benefit of each and every one of you as a corporate unit who are Gentiles, even let's assume it's true for the sake of argument, that each and every one of you as a corporate unit have surely heard about the stewardship, which is unique to the grace which originates from the one and only God, which was given to me for the benefit of all of you as a corporate unit without exception. Of course, response to first class condition we noted, of course, every one of you have in fact heard about it. Namely, that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as revelation, as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner, concerning which that is, by each one of you making your habit of hearing read publicly, all of you will for your own benefit become able to comprehend my insight into this incomparable mystery which is produced by your unique union and identification with Christ. This mystery was by no means made known to members of the human race in previous dis- generations, as it has now been revealed through the personal agency of his holy apostles, as well as prophets, by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit, namely, that the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, as well as fellow members of the body, likewise fellow partakers of the promise, because of justification by faith in, and union and identification with Christ Jesus by means of the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 7, I assumed the position and responsibility of serving this gospel according to the gift originating from the one and only God's grace, which was given to me according to the activity produced by the exercise of his power. To me, the less than least of all the saints, this grace was given in order to proclaim for my benefit to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth brought about by this justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ, specifically in order to cause everyone in the Christian community, of course, to be enlightened as to what constitutes this unique dispensation, the church age, which is a mystery, which has been hidden from previous ages because of God's will, who has caused each and every animate and inanimate object to be created. Consequently, the multifaceted wisdom produced by the manifestation of the will of God was made known to the sovereign rulers and governmental authorities in the heavenlies, that's the Satan's kingdom, through the members of the church. This was in conformity with the eternal predetermined plan which he the Father caused to be accomplished by means of our faith in Jesus and our union identification with the one and only Christ who is Jesus, who is the one and only Lord ruling over each and every one of us as a corporate unit. On the basis of our faith in and union identification with him, Each and every one of us are experiencing boldness, namely access with confidence to the presence of the Father by means of his faithfulness. Therefore, I myself urgently request at the present time that each and every one of you as a corporate unit not be discouraged because of my adversities on behalf of all of you without exception, which are unique in character, making possible for each and every one of you to receive honor. Now, as we uh, pointed out in our last class, and actually the previous two classes, uh, Ephesians 3.3 3 is composed of two parts. We have a Hody epexegetical clause, and it's followed by a comparative clause. And the Hody epexegetical clause is, uh, is uh, translated that by Re- in the Net Bible, that by revelation the divine secret was made known to me. 
And uh, we see the comparative clause, which follows it, is this, as I wrote before briefly. Now, the Hodiap exegetical clause, which for those who are interested, the Greek text is hati kata apokalupsin egonist egonoriste moi ta mysterion, which I translate namely that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as a revelation. And the comparative clause is uh, is proegrapsa en holigo, which I translate as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner. Now, as we pointed out also, the Hodi Epexegetical Clause, Epexegetical means explanatory. The Hodi Epexegetical Clause explains the meaning of the noun ekoinomia, which is the word for stewardship. In fact, it actually explains, as we pointed out, specifically the nature of this stewardship. Namely, it was being a steward of the mystery of the divine secret that was made known to Paul by revelation from the Holy Spirit. Now, as we noted also, the word for revelation, apocalypsis, is uh, it's tra- translated correctly revelation here, and it refers to Paul's stewardship, which we also noted he defines as the mystery of Christ, which was communicated through the gospel by the apostles and prophets of Jesus by the agency of the Spirit. And the content of this revelation, as we saw in verse 6, is that Jewish and Gentile church-age believers are on equal footing. They're now fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise, and that's because of being in Christ Jesus. When you see my translation of that prepositional phrase, in Christo Yesu, or in Him, you see that, or in the Beloved, and the first two, three chapters of Ephesians, it's Paul's using shorthand. It's shorthand for the fact that they've been declared, the, the recipients of this letter, have been declared justified through faith in Christ, and simultaneously, at the, through the baptism of the Spirit, they were identified with Christ, and His crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection session at the right hand of the Father. That all, Thus, all the things that Paul says is coming to the, these believers is a result of those things, the justification by faith and the baptism of the Spirit. So the content, again, of that mystery we pointed out is that Jewish and Gentile believers are now fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise because of their faith in Jesus at justification and their resultant union identification with Christ through the baptism of the Spirit. It was a mystery in the sense, as we saw, that it was a secret plan, God's secret plan, not known to the Old Testament saints, but now communicated during the church age through the apostles and prophets of Jesus and found now in the New Testament. The purpose of this enlightenment, as we also pointed out to you in verse uh, 10, I believe, is uh, is that it was to disclose to Satan and his kingdom and the heavenly realms through the church the multifaceted wisdom of God now, you understand why he's in prison and why he's unjustly treated. Okay? That's why he's there. And this is one of the reasons why he's trying to persuade them not to get discouraged by his adversities. It's because he's a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, the word musterion, mystery, you can translate the Bible, the next Bible call, uh, translate divine secret, and uh, which is a great translation. And um, I use mystery. I probably should have used these divine secrets, probably a better uh, translation. But anyways, um, this word musterion, mystery, is that Gentile Jewish church age believers, as we saw, are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise because of their faith in Jesus at justification and union identification with Him. Now, Ephesians 3.3 3 expands or, or explains in greater detail or provides more information about the Father's will for the church age in Ephesians 1.9. Namely, because in Ephesians 1.9, the word mystery, musterion, is used for the first time in the letter. And we see that, again, Ephesians 3.3 is explaining or expanding upon in greater detail or providing more information, we could say, about the Father's will for the church age believer in Ephesians 1.9. What's that? Well, namely, that it also involves Gentile and Jewish church age believers being fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise, again, because of their faith in Christ, the justification and union identification with Him. So therefore, in each instance, Ephesians 1, 9, and here in Ephesians 3, 3, the word mystery has the same referent, because the Father's will for the church age believer, which was not known to the Old Testament prophets, is that Gentile and Jewish church age believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise because of their faith in Christ Jesus at justification and their union identification with Him. So this mystery about Jewish and Gentile church age believers is not only alluded to in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14 
and Ephesians 3, 2 through 13, but it's also alluded to, as we'll say, to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, develops this idea of these Gentiles being elected by being predestinated in eternity past to adoption as sons of the Father, and that's taught in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, teaches that Gentile church age believers are united with Jewish gen, uh, believers. And because of their faith in Christ, the justification, and again, their union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. Thus, if you put it all together, thus election and predestination, which are talked about in the first chapter of church age believers, to adoption as sons of the Father, taught by Paul in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, also involves Jewish and Gentile church age believers being together united to form the new humanity who along with Jesus Christ will dispossess Satan and his fellow evil spirits as rulers over God's creation in order to rule over the works of God's hands during Jesus Christ's millennial reign. So uh, this is why Paul again is being in, was unjustly incarcerated and why he was sitting in, a, in, a, in his own rented quarters with but no freedom. And uh, so uh, so this is very important you understand because this is the message that pastors are supposed to get out is this message you're supposed to teach you know teach the, the full counsel of god and this is a big part of the full counsel of god for the church age believer it directly involves us and god wants you and i to know who we are in christ and we're not only created in the image of god but we're also uh in the image of christ and we and who restored the fallen image of uh god and, and, and fallen humanity but uh, we're also in union with christ you know, God looks at us as he looks at his son, crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with his son at his right hand. He, where, Ephesians 5 uh, says that we're the bride of Christ. Ephesians 2, he, we're the, part of the new humanity with Jewish church age believers. And so you're a ruler. You're a ruler. You're going to reign with Christ over, uh, over this earth for a thousand years. That Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, don't you know you're going to judge angels? And so you need to know that. You need to know the power that's available to you, which we're going to talk about in this upcoming prayer chapter at the end of chapter three. And you need to know the great power and love that's been demonstrated toward you and we benefited from at our justification and eternity past, now and in the future with the resurrection body and rewards of faithful service and uh, access to the new heavens and the new earth and the millennial reign of Christ. So this is big stuff, people. That's who you are in Christ, okay? Too many Christians are walking around as uh, paupers, you know, they, they don't realize what they got, you know, it's like having a Maserati in the, ga in the gar garage and yet you drive around with a Pinto from 1972, you know, that's what believers are like that, they, they live their lives as if they're not important, as if uh, this is all there is and uh, that there's no future for them, they act as if God's never loved them, you know. But by the way, they their priorities, the way they 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 view life, and uh, you know you can't even distinguish some believers from the the non-believer, which is very very sad. So let's go to go. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter one verse three, and we'll read Ephesians one three through fourteen, and then Ephesians two eleven through twenty two, and then get back to our verse again and talk about that that comparative clause that finishes off verse three. So let's look at Ephesians one verse three. I'm going to read from my translation of that uh, particular uh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. I'll read it from my translation. So again, we're reading from my translation. Look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. 14 with me. The God, namely the Father of the Lord ruling over us, who is Jesus Christ, is worthy of praise. Namely, because he's the one who has blessed each and every one of us in the church age by means of every kind of spirit-appropriated blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. For he chose each and every one of us in the Christian community for his own purpose, because of him alone, before creation, in order that each and every one of us would be holy as well as uncensurable in his judgment. He did this by predestinating each and every one of us for the purpose of adoption as sons, because of his love, through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the pleasure of his will. This was for the purpose of praising his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on each and every one of us because of the one who is divinely loved, his son. 
because of him, his son. Each and every one of us are experiencing that which is the redemption through his blood, namely, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to his infinite grace. This he provided in abundance for the benefit of each and every one of us because of the exercise of a wisdom which is absolute and divine in nature, resulting in a manifestation of an insight which is absolute and divine in nature. He did this by revealing the mystery of his will for the benefit of each and every one of us according to his pleasure, which he planned beforehand because of our faith in and union identification with himself. This was for the dispensation which brings to completion the various periods of history, namely, to unite for the benefit of himself each and every animate and inanimate object in the sphere of the sovereign authority of the person of the one and only Christ. Specifically, to unite for the benefit of himself those things in the heavens as well as those things on the earth in the sphere of the sovereign authority of himself. So you're in union with Christ, and what is Christ? He sits at the right hand of the Father, doesn't he? And the whole earth is his now. Verse 11, and if it's his, it's also ours. Because of whom? Because of Jesus. Each and every one of us have been claimed as a possession because of having been predestinated according to the predetermined plan. Namely, the one who is causing each and every animate and inanimate object to function according to his purpose. That is, his sovereign will. In order that each and every one of us in the Christian community would belong to a particular group of people. Namely, those who are certain of possessing a confident expectation of blessing because of their faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ for the purpose of praising His glory. Verse 13, correspondingly, because of whom, because of Christ, each and every one of you were sealed by means of the omnipotence of the one and only promised Spirit, who is holy, because each and every one of you obeyed the one and only message, which is truth, namely, the proclamation of the one and only gospel, which produced your salvation, specifically because each one of you believed in Him. The Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until He redeems His possession, that's the church, for the praise of His glory. So, chapter 1, we're going back to chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, we just read, because along with Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, uh, together those passages, and you couple them with what we see in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, we have a better, clearer picture of the church and the nature of the church, the composition of the church, and the future of the church. Not, not just to mention the past of the church and where it originated from uh, and, uh, and, 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 and how it all was accomplished through whom. And so this is very important that you know this. And because when we talk about mystery in Ephesians 3, 3, okay, uh, he says, you know, I wrote about this mystery briefly. Well, that's one, he briefly talked about it in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And he talks about it in another place, as I just pointed out to you a few moments ago. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So let's look at that in my translation. So Ephesians 2, 11, it says, Therefore, each and every one of you, as a corporate unit, must continue to make it your habit of remembering that formerly each of you who belong to the Gentile race with respect to the human body, specifically those who receive the designation uncircumcision, by those who receive the designation circumcision with respect to the human body performed by human hands, each and every one of you used to be characterized as without a relationship with Christ, each and every one of you used to be alienated from the nation of Israel's citizenship. Specifically, each one of you used to be strangers to the most important promise, which is the product of the covenants. Each of you used to not possess a confident expectation of blessing. Consequently, each of you used to be without a relationship with God in the sphere of the cosmic world system. However, because of your faith in and union and identification with Christ Jesus, each and every one of you is a corporate unit who formerly were far away have now been brought near by the means of the blood belonging to this same Christ. For he himself personifies our peace, namely, by causing both groups to be one, specifically by destroying the wall, which served as the barrier, that is, that which caused hostility between the two races with each other and the two with God. In other words, by nullifying, by means of his human nature, the law composed of the commandments consisting of a written code of laws, in order that he might cause the two, to be created into one new humanity. What was the means he did this? By means of faith in himself and justification and union and identification with himself through the baptism of the Spirit. Thus, 
He caused peace to be established between the two races with each other and the two races with God. In other words, in order that he would reconcile both groups into one body to God through his cross. Consequently, he, the Lord, put to death the hostility, again, with the interaction between the two races and the two races with God. By means of faith in himself and justification, he did this, and union and identification with himself through the baptism of the Spirit. Correspondingly, he, as a result, came proclaiming peace for the benefit of each and every one of you Gentile Christians. Namely, those who are far off, likewise peace to those who are near, the Jews. Consequently, through the personal intermediate agency of himself, each and every one of us, both Jewish and Gentile church age believers, as a corporate unit, namely both groups, are experiencing access by means of the omnipotence of the one spirit to the presence of the Father. Indeed, therefore, each and every one of you as a corporate unit are no longer foreigners to the covenants of promise, that is, foreign citizens, but rather each and every one of you as a corporate unit of fellow citizens with the saints, that is, members of God's household, why? Verse 20 tells us why. Because each and every one of you as a corporate unit have been built upon the foundation, which is the communication of the gospel to each of you by the apostles as well as prophets. Simultaneously, he himself, namely Christ Jesus, is the cornerstone on the basis of its being continually fitted inextricably together by means of our justification by faith and our union identification with him. The whole building is growing into a holy temple and this is growing spiritually in, in, in the present tense by appropriating by faith, union, and identification with the Lord. In other words, verse 22, by appropriating by faith, your union and identification with Him, all of you without exception are being built together into God's dwelling place by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. So, we see that uh, back here, this mystery about Jewish and Gentile church age believers is not only alluded to in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It's where I first mentioned of it. And it's also, as we see in Ephesians 3, 2 through 13. But it's also alluded to in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which we just read. Why? Because that chapter, chapter 2, develops the idea of these Gentile Christians being elected by being predestinated in eternity past to adoption as sons of the Father, which we just pointed out and read and studied in great detail is found in Ephesians 1, 3-14. And as we just read, and we studied this in, in tremendous detail, Ephesians 2, 11-22 teaches that Gentile church-age believers are now united with Jewish believers, not Jewish Gentile believers, sorry, sorry about the typo. And so the, he's, he, Ephesians 2, 11-22 is teaching us that the Gentile church-age believers are united with Jewish church-age believers because of their faith in Jesus' at justification and their union identification with Him through the baptism of the Spirit. Thus, election, and the, together they compose the, hum, the new humanity. Thus, election and predestination of church-age believers, both Jew and Gentile, to adoption as sons of the Father, taught by Paul in Ephesians 1, 3-14, also involves Jewish and Gentile church-age believers being united together to form the new humanity, who, along with Jesus Christ, will dispossess Satan and his fellow evil spirits as rulers over God's creation in order to rule over the works of his hands during Jesus Christ's millennial reign. So very important we know that. God wants you to know that. The devil doesn't. The enemy does not want that, and it, he doesn't want it taught, and, and sadly it's not being taught as the way it should be. And uh, we see that uh, th that's another story for another day, but it, and I've pointed out oh, what's going on in American Christianity at the pulpit many times. And uh, this is a sad situation, but it ought not to be the case. And uh, but uh, so right here is the plan of God for your life. As you're a Gentile church age believer, and you, are, you and I, we in the, in the 21st century, we really don't understand this the way we should. Remember, in the first century, prior to the church, remember for 2,000 years, the church had been primarily Gentile, small remnant of Jewish believers. Okay. And uh, early on, though, it was all Jewish until Cornelius' family came in. Now, prior to that, in the Old Testament times, that's, and particularly the, the dispensation of the law, you, you were a Gentile if you became a Jewish proselyte, and there were many, that uh, you were not on equal footing with a Jewish believer. Uh, heck, if you're a woman back then, you were not on equal footing with the men. And in fact, not everybody was a Levitical priest. Only the tribe of Levi could be priests. 
And those guys could only serve up to 50 years of age, and then they had to retire. And so, uh, so we are now in the church age, as Paul says, in Galatians 3, 26 through 28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, all are one in Christ. We, in other words, we have equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the Father's plan. We're on equal footing, far as the plan of God is. And uh, the, the, the ability to get a, a rewards of the Bama seat and reign with Christ in his millennial government. So this is super, this is super stuff here. So uh, today we take this, we take this stuff for granted. But for a Gentile in the first century, to be like it was astounding. In fact, for the Jewish believers, like like Peter and the other apostles and and Paul, this was astounding that you know because the Jews looked at Gentiles as second class citizens and they were treated as such. They didn't they didn't really have much to deal with the Gentiles unless they had to. We see this in the Gospels, okay. But uh, Jesus was doing certain things, reaching out to certain Gentiles, even though he was sent to the house of Israel. But he's kind of given his disciples, like the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. She's a woman. Rabbis didn't have anything with women. And the Jews didn't have anything with, uh, the rabbis didn't have anything with women. And the Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. Okay, because there was a great racial prejudice, okay, between the two. Jesus was already planting the seeds to break that down during his first advent. So now, with the Holy Spirit, the moment of our justification, when we trusted in Jesus as our Savior, the Father declared us justified, right? That moment, the Holy Spirit, the baptism Spirit, placed us in union with Christ, united us with Christ. That's why you have uh, metaphors like Christ is the vine, uh, we're the vine, he, uh, he's the vine, we're the branches. You know, he's the chief cornerstone, right? We just read that. We're the stones in the building. Uh, you know, he's the head, we're the members of the body. He's the bridegroom, we're the bride. All that's trying to tell us in, in very colorful, explicit detail, how inextricably tied to Jesus Christ you and I are. You don't have any more problems, really. I mean, we have problems, but they're, they're temporary. It's going to pass away. Momentary light affliction will produce an eternal weight of glory. And we can't, we, we're, we're, we, we've been delivered from our greatest enemy, eternal condemnation, enslavement of sin and Satan in his cosmic system, personal sins, spiritual and physical death. None of those things have any power over us now. And you are a position. You are a person that is very, very, very important to God. Hey, if He sent His Son to the cross for us when we were His enemy, for each and every person in the human race, that tells you how much He He thinks and values you. And now that you, His child through faith in His Son, is He going to freely give you all things? Romans eight thirty two. Yeah. And I, and so, you know, our relationship and fellowship with God and our union identification with Christ is the most important thing we possess. Okay. In fact, uh, God's our inheritance, and also, you know, God's our, and, uh, we're God's possession as well. He, I am yours, you are mine, right? And that's how, it, so you need to know that as a believer. So anytime, you know, people get down about their relationships with their marriage, and their, you know, everybody, every, human relationships are difficult, right? Especially marriage. You know, don't, I understand, I, can, I feel sorry, because I see a lot of people who are not in marriages, they, they think they're getting enough love or attention or whatever. It's not working out or something, you know, but look at, you know, pray for those people, first of all. But also, you know, I think sometimes we're looking for human relationships, something only God could give, you know, but something to think about. I think we're looking for, we're looking for perfection, which we never get, you know, with a human being because this sin is like us and you're never going to be a perfect mate either and a perfect friend or whatever. So things to keep in mind. And so you and I are going to, again, as we saw in this, uh, Last point, as we saw about election and predestination of the church age believer in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, um, we see that uh, this mystery, that thus this election and predestination of the church age believers to adoption as sons of the Father, taught by Paul in Ephesians 1, also involves Jewish and Gentile church age believers being united together to form the new humanity, who along with Jesus Christ will dispossess Satan and his fellow evil spirits, as rulers over God's creation, and this is for the purpose to rule over the works of God's hands during Jesus Christ's millennial reign, thus restoring humanity to its rightful position as ruler of the works of God's hands. And we saw this in uh, Satan's the god of this world right now, okay? But that's temporary. When the Christ comes back at a second advent and the uh, tribulation period and the times of the Gentiles, that's when he's going to remove them. Now, the comparative clause in Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, if you look at the Net Bible again, it says, 
that by revelation the divine secret was made known to me. Then he says, as I wrote before briefly, as we pointed out uh, a few moments ago in previous classes, the comparative clause, pro egrapsa and holigo, which I translate as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner, this follows, this comparative clause follows the Hodi epexegetical clause. And it refers to Paul writing about this mystery, the comparative clause does, concerning Jewish and Gentile church age believers. It, it, it's, it's alluding to the fact that he wrote about it earlier in those two passages we read earlier, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which we studied in great detail. So the adverb kathos, which is translated as, functions as a marker of comparison. That's why it's translated as such. And this means that it's marking a comparison between the Hodi exegetical clause and this comparative clause, which follows it. Now, the comparative clause, again, refers to the contents of Ephesians 1.9, which we noted speaks of the mystery of the, the, that the Father's will for church-age believers, and uh, it's, which is explained in great detail in Ephesians 3, verses 2 through 13. So therefore, this adverb kathos in Ephesians 3, 3 is actually marking a comparison between the contents of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13, with the contents of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. In this comparative clause, the word prographo means to write beforehand or previously, to write in advance or in anticipation of, and it's modified by the prepositional phrase and holigo, which identifies Paul as writing about this divine secret or mystery in a brief manner. And now the aorist tense of this verb, prographo, uh, writing previously or writing beforehand. The aorist tense of this verb is not a consummative uh, aorist which emphasizes the cessation of the action of the verb, which could thus emphasize the cessation of the act of Paul writing about this mystery in a brief or concise manner. Rather, this is what we call an immediate, immediate past aorist or dramatic aorist, some call it, which when used with the indicative mood can be used of an event that happened rather recently. Dr. Dan Wallace whose uh, grammar is uh, used in all seminaries, around, a lot of seminaries around the world, probably all of them. <laughs> he, and he, he's, he did, he's, he's very, uh, this grammar is fantastic and helped me understand the New Testament. But he writes the following about this dramatic arist, or immediate past arist, some call it. He says, and I'm quoting, its force can usually be brought out with something like just now, or, or as in just now I told you. And this may be lexically colored, occurring with verbs of emotion and understanding, in other words, what he means by that. But more often, it's due to a Semitic coloring, reflecting a Semitic state of perfect. As well, it's, it's sometimes difficult to tell, he says, whether the aorist refers to the immediate past or to the present dramatic. End of quote. So therefore, what we see here is that the aorist tense of this word prographo, as I wrote before briefly, is used to Paul writing in Ephesians 1, 3-14, and Ephesians 2, 11-22, about this mystery, not known to Old Testament prophets, that Jewish and Gentile church-age believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise, all because they were declared justified through faith in Christ, and simultaneously placed in union with Him through the baptism of the Spirit. I not only believe that this Comparative clause in Ephesians 3 3 refers to Paul's teaching in Ephesians 1 3 through 10, but also to his teaching, as I said before, in Ephesians 2 11 through 22. And this is indicated by the fact that these verses, verses 2, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, develop the idea of these Gentile Christians being elected by being predestinated in eternity past to adoption as sons of the Father. So Ephesians 2 11 through 22, as we pointed out, teaches us that Jewish and Gentile church age believers are forming together the new humanity and that's going to reign over with Christ during his millennial reign and dispossess Satan and the fallen angels. Thus, as I said before, earlier in the class, the election of predestination of church age believers to adoption as sons of the Father, as taught by Paul in the first chapter, also involves Jewish and Gentile church age believers being to, united together to form that new humanity led by Jesus Christ, which will dispossess, I said, as I said before, Satan and his fellow evil spirits in order to rule over the works of God's hands during Jesus Christ's millennial reign. Thus, as we close, the comparative clause, which is translated by the Net Bible, as I wrote before briefly, that comparative, uh, comparative clause is emphasizing that Paul wrote about this mystery, we could say divine secret, about Jewish and Gentile church-age believers briefly, 
and Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, before writing about it now in detail in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13. So again, we see Paul, he explains himself. He's a great teacher, obviously. And uh, he, exp- he develops, he, uh, you know, ch- as I said before, if you remember when we started off this book, the f- verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1 are basically the, the, pre- the preface to this letter. Everything he says in this preface, he develops later. Yeah, it's kind of like when we did First Thessalonians, which I'm teaching over here now at uh, Doctrinal Bible Church. The first chapter of First Thessalonians is, is the introduction to the letter. And he brings up all the points in that introduction, that first chapter, things he's going to develop in greater detail later in the book. Okay, Same thing he does here in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is the preface. He's introducing a bunch of subjects that he's going to develop later on. One of those subjects is... Uh, is the mystery, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the church age believer has been elected in eternity past by means of predestinating them to adoption of sons because of their faith in Christ, the justification and the union identification with them through the baptism of the Spirit. And they're going to reign with Christ during his millennial reign. And then he develops that further in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, saying that Jewish and Gentile church age believers are the new humanity. That's why they're going to reign with Christ during his millennial reign, as we saw in Ephesians 1.10. And then, now we get to chapter 3, verses 1-13. through 13. Now he's going to say, this mystery is further, a Jewish and Gentile church age believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the Messianic promise. So he's developing it further and further and further. Then, he prays for them for the second time, second and final time, in verses 14 to the end of the chapter. And then we get into what we call in chapters 4, 5, and 6, the the uh, application of the first three, uh, the first three chapters. So, what we need to see is that what I'm saying is that what who who God what God did for us in eternity past and in our justification is very important in how we live our lives now. Okay, yeah, you are you are you have your spiritual aristocracy, your ruler with Christ, and uh, the world hasn't seen what you really are. You may not look like much, and either do I, but we are actually something. They see us in our resurrection bodies, and if we got rewards for faithful service, look out. So uh, so we are very, po- we're in a great, powerful position at the right hand of the Father, and we're his bride of Christ, okay? And so therefore, how we live now is extremely important. And because of what God did for us in the past should be motivation to, uh, for us to live in a manner that's consistent with that. And, as we pointed out, the purpose of this book is to maintain unity between the, experientially, between the Jewish and Gentile wings of the church. How are you going to do that? Through practicing the command to love one another. John 13, 34. John 15, 12. Love one another in the Christian community. Love each other as Christ has loved us. And all that involves. And that's how we'll maintain unity experientially. And this is what the world needs now is God's love, you know, not Burke Baccarat's, you know, human love. It's uh, love, God's love. And look at God did for us sinners when we, who, when we were his enemies and when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, right? Ephesians 2, 1 through 8. He's a pretty, he's a pretty great God and he demands, he, he deserves our worship. He deserves our obedience and faith. He deserves our uh, everything. We got, that's why we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, the neighbor and self. There's a good reason for it, okay? First, he's our creator, and everything we have is comes from him. Uh, even our bodies and our souls and our volition, gift from God. And so everything we have should go right back to him. Whatever talents we have, our gifts, and uh, whatever it is, he owes us, we owe him everything. And we should do it, not because we're told to do it, but we should do it, we do, we're going to we'll do it because we love him. And he's given us good reasons why we should love him. And so, you know, if God loves you, you got it all made, people. You know, I not have the love of a spouse or a lover. You might not be married. And you might not, your children might abandon you and not go see you or whatever. You don't, you know, but at the end of the day, if you got the love of God, if God loves you, then what are we worried about? I'd rather have, you know, I'd rather have God's love any day of the week, right? Because he'll never let you down. We let each other down because we're sinners, right? Well, we'll pick this up on next Tuesday, uh, Lord willing, at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. 
and we move on to verse 4, Ephesians 3, 4, and uh, we'll be working on Ephesians 3, 4, like uh, for the, the whole week, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, like we did the first three verses. And the reason why I do that is because of the content, all right? A lot to explain. So let's uh, close in prayer. Thank you for joining us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that everybody was here, and I thank you for everybody who was here live or through the recordings. I thank you for them, and I just pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit do a mighty work and uh, convicting and uh, of sin, of um, encouraging them to persevere and not quit on your plan and to instruct them in righteousness and how to live and, uh, and uh, also for uh, exhortation uh, to live the spiritual life. And uh, we just thank you for our union identification with your son and treating us better than we deserved. And then we just pray, Father, that we could show our gratification to you by the way we live our lives and with our words and praising you as well. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ,